Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas. We're on the show floor at HPE Discover 2024. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante with Cube Research, and David Linthicum with theCUBE Research, also luminary speaker here at HPE Discover 24 on the big stage for Tech Talk right next to theCUBE. David, great to see you. It was nice to see you holding court on stage here at the Tech Talk Arena next to us. Yeah, it's, it's great to be here. It was a perfect infrastructure. I could look at you guys who are doing reporting and you could look back <laughs> at me. So we had, the, we had the whole corner. I kind of got my, you got my attention. Hmm, I love those slides. Okay. Cloud migration failures, really talking about the on-prem movement back, or say never left. Right. Um, well, there is, there is some back. There is, Give yeah, an overview. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, um, you know, as we've been covering in theCUBE, there's uh, really a movement into heterogeneous kinds of architecture. So people aren't moving just to the cloud anymore, and certainly with AI, but they're moving to a mix of hardware platforms in the cloud, and there's reasons to use both. And I think what happened over the last 10 years is that uh, utilization of the cloud was probably oversold within the enterprises. You know, who would have thunk that? Well, it was the fact that we were looking for scalability, cost efficiency, all the things that cloud is able to do. And, and cloud is able to deliver on some of that, but where they weren't able to deliver on cost effectiveness. So what happened uh, over the last 15 years that we've been migrating stuff into the cloud, we're not getting the value that's coming back in the enterprise from the utilization of these cloud resources. So people are starting to understand that. I, I view the, the uh, reckoning moment being 2022. Everybody moved to the cloud in 2020 with the pandemic. Suddenly these big, huge cloud bills came in once these things were operationalized and I would get call after call after calls of what the heck's going on. This thing is a lot more expensive than I thought it was going to be. So, um, when you look at why you it's- You can't just turn it off. Well, I, you can't just turn it off. You can't just turn it off. Yeah. You, got, you got all your applications in there. And uh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> but what, what happened was, is that no one modernized the systems that were moved. They just lifted and shifted them. So it was very easy, and cloud actually is very good at this, at providing good platform analogs for LAMP stacks and you know, even AI-based platforms. They're able to pick it up and push it over to the cloud and have it run in that environment. And the problem is, is that operational inefficiency is going to cost you money. In other words, it's like plugging a very inefficient electronic device into the grid, it's going to cost you money. And so organizations saw this, and this was kind of like a, a dirty little secret for a few years, where I watched all this repatriation going on, no one was talking about it, because repatriation is kind of code for we screwed up, you know, oopsie yeah. daisy, hit the reset button. But it got enough momentum, we're putting some uh, emphasis behind it, some, uh, some intelligence, some uh, methodologies, frameworks, and how to make this stuff happen. So it's really right-sizing or normalizing yeah. of the application. And the cloud course. people called it cloud optimization. Well, so we over-rotated, you're saying, mm -hmm. in, during the pandemic. Yes. And then Andy Jassy says that cloud optimization is attenuated. Is that because people are spending more and not, not optimizing, or because they're moving back on-prem? I think they're moving back on-prem, and when he's looking why they're doing it, he would say, he would argue that you did not optimize your applications for the cloud, which means leveraging cloud-native features, things like that. That's tremendously expensive to do that. You have to hire consulting companies and service firms and hire very expensive talent to modernize these applications, move them to container-based systems, serverless-based systems, things like that. Most organizations didn't do that. Very few applications were modernized for the cloud, and so, the, the way that the cloud providers fought back against it is they say, well, you guys haven't optimized in the cloud. So we heard the O word you know, at the last reInvent. And the reality is the O word is just them admitting to the fact that you're going to have to change a significant amount of your application in order for the thing to run on the cloud at a rate and an operational spend rate that, that would be reasonable. Well, they'll also mean like storage tiering, which is like, that's like a little sliver of cost reduction. Okay, not a huge deal, but so, what if you do optimize? What, what's your experience if somebody moves to the cloud, they bring in you know, your former firm and, or, or others, and they optimize, what, what is the TCO comparison? Because you, you talk to the on-prem guys, they say, well, we did this study with IDC, and it shows that we're, uh, we're, we're more cost effective. Then you go to Amazon, they say, we did this study with IDC, and it shows that we're more cost effective. And the customer's left to say, well, wait a minute. So what's the truth? It's the it depends answer everybody hates. So ultimately it's how the application was architected, how tightly it's coupled to the database, how, how, how it's bound to the processor, all these very geeky things that come into play. And so you can take this application that was built 20 years ago that didn't consider the optimization on the particular cloud provider, and so what we're doing is just basically putting it on the platform in the cloud. 
cloud. We didn't have to optimize in those days. We had the entire server. It was at our disposal. So now yeah. we do, now when we put it on the cloud, they're charging us for all of that under optimization within the system. So optimization means um, rebuilding the application in many instances for the ground up. So it's going to leverage much fewer resources and resources in a more optimized way. And you can actually, if you do that right, you can move an application <laughs> in the cloud and get it to burn one third of the costs. And so the opportunity's there, but in many instances it was a million dollars in application and the enterprise is like, yeah. So big buy. upfront cost, you can eventually get there, then you don't have as much headroom and flexibility with that, you know, the leftover capacity is really what, what I'm hearing here. That's absolutely right, yeah. absolutely Maybe right. virtualization could help, Dave, no, only kidding. <laughs> uh, A.J. Battelle, was then when he was at VMware, said on theCUBE, I'll never forget this, Dave, um, he said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a middleware guy. The cloud is just hardware. <laughs> and I, I'm like, actually, you know what? You're actually not wrong. <laughs> the benefit of AWS was so storage and servers, EC2 and queuing. Those are the building blocks. If you wanted to lift and shift, you can get hosting on demand and variable pricing. Great for data processing, okay, check. But what we're seeing here at HPE, David, is that you can got hardware. You can just put another rack in for AI, so for the folks that want to like play around, that seems to be a good pitch. It is a good pitch. Because they, know, they know data center, there's a power envelope issue, they're addressing it. I, that's a sellable what value prop. What t-shirt size do you want? It's like, it's like okay, the, I know how to deal with racks. Yeah. Put a rack in, and that's my AI rack. Now the question is, will that be scope for the workload? So is it the right hardware? So we're in this hardware scoping stage of generative AI. How do you see that playing out, and how does that factor into the, the cloud, which is essentially hybrid distributed computing? The cloud is always going to be a more convenient place to run AI because the ecosystem comes along with it. In other words, I get, get, get to vector databases, I get, get to odd middleware layers and streaming systems, things like that, all on my portal, I'm able to assemble it together. It's just going to be more expensive to run, so that's going to be the trade-off. So what we're seeing here at uh, HPE Discovery is that we're, in essence, bundling this stuff into an AI framework to compete with the cloud. You look at the, what they announced today in the keynote I was in, HPE private AI, private cloud AI, is basically trying to replicate the convenience of the cloud, but doing so on premise within a, within a data center based yeah. system. So we have the advantage there. Number one, we own the hardware, some yeah. people like to do that. But the price of hardware has just come down like, a, like crazy in the last 10 years, and so that blew a huge hole yeah, into cloud bingo. computing. So they're offering alternatives and not a DIY kind of situation where people have to assemble it themselves. I think that's where people get nervous, and if they're off of bundled solutions at our racks, that kind of looks very cool to them. Yeah, and Dave, what's interesting about NVIDIA is that, and we talked about this earlier, they could have an Amazon-like like situation here where they can get the benefit of HP's enterprise because their NIMs are proprietary. I mean, that's the secret, dirty little secret for the model stack. So they say, hey, you want to build your own rag and some inference? Yeah. Use NIMs, our NVIDIA inference microservice, which is essentially proprietary, it's theirs. So if they get them locked in on NVIDIA. But it's yours. Yeah. But, you, but it's your <laughs> well, the enterprise it's your get model. to have their own models. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how does that fit in? Because now you have, it, it feels like a, a network operating system in a way. It's like they're giving a, a NOS to the enterprise. And they'll probably use it. My point is I think that might be the biggest land grab opportunity for NVIDIA to jump in on the model stack and say, hey, we'll own the model stack. Well, because people That's are what saying. because people are concerned about open source licensing, and you know some of them that read the fine print. Meta says, "Look, you know we reserve the right to pull the rug out." Well, no, they got the no, they got the data to worry about. So if I'm an enterprise, I might say, "Hey, you know what? I'll go with NVIDIA and HPE because I want to protect my data. Why do I want to well, put exactly. my model into into anything else that well, exactly. I can't control?" So, so okay, NIMS, NVIDIA, Spine, Leaf, Horsepower. The trade off is it's closed. Trade. Right. An iPhone. But, uh, exactly. <laughs> I mean, Oracle. In, NVIDIA is going to make more money on selling hardware with partners like HPE uh, yeah. and, and other folks there as well as, than, than they will in the cloud. And I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head. If we're going to leverage the, co the core and NVIDIA features, we're going to be locked in, there's that word, into that particular platform. And if we're building these net new generative AI systems, then that's going to be an HPE movement for the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah. And so we're building these things for the long term they're going to take a tremendous amount of hardware resources yeah. in doing that. I think NVIDIA seems the land grabbed as well and that's why they're working with partners like HPE. Well, and also AMD and Intel aren't sitting uh, on their hands right now, so NVIDIA's got a great run right now. Their market cap's at all time high. Why not just nail down everything you can right now? And one of them is the enterprise AI market. 
I would be doing the same thing. That's why we're seeing the NVIDIA CEO at every conference out there, and uh, you know, he's, a, he's in front of everybody now because he's gra he knows he has to grab the land before eventually some of the innovation catches up and his competitors catch up, yeah. and he's not going to have the, uh, the, the, the monolithic share that he has now. Um, I want to come back to repatriation, if I can, for a moment. Because we know and anecdotally, when you talk to customers, you, you got the phone calls, and we talk to people, <laughs> they go, yeah, we're going to move some more clothes back. Um, yet, when you look at the numbers, help me square this circle. So Dell last quarter, let's use Dell and HPE as a proxy. We'll throw in Supermicro for kicks, but they're not really you know, an enterprise. Yeah, they're definitely you know, doing well right now. They're, but they're selling to hyperscalers and, 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 and big MSPs. But taking Dell and, and, and HPE, Dell last quarter grew 6%, they're, they're promising 3 to 4% growth. They're a $95 billion company, trading at 1x their $95 billion value. HPE grew at 4%, they're promising only 1 to 3%, I think that's conservative. They're a $30 billion company, trading at 1x revenue. And then you got AWS growing, at, this is just hardware, by the way, I've stripped out, tried to anyway, all the, the 365 and other stuff that Microsoft throws in. AWS grew at 17%, Azure almost 30%, GCP, 28%, so help me understand, you, you got the cloud guy's growing you know, much, much faster. Right. If there wasn't repatriation, would Dell and HP grow, be growing at 0%? No, I think they would be growing at a, at a more rapid rate because of the utilization of AI. I mean, you wrote, you wrote in your analyst brief on Friday that it's really, the cloud is leading the way because people see that as the path of more, most convenience for building these AI systems. Yeah. But I think that the on-premise stuff is going to catch up fairly quickly and they're going to see some huge growth as well, which is also going to be driven by AI. So everybody gets the AI tide that rises all ships, brings everybody forward. The cloud folks have a lot of momentum, huge marketing in, in the marketing momentum right now, they have the eyes and ears of the CIOs out there. So they're going to hold that position for as long as they can. So I think you're right, by the way, which suggests that, because Dell has run up a lot in this past year. Um, HPE has not run up as much. If you actually look at the stock prices of these companies uh, over the past year, Dell's up 173% as of last Friday. Supermicro's up 250%, but forget those guys for a second. H HPE's only up 30%. But, but they're up 30% in, in, or 22% in the last 30 days. Right. So HPE is catching up. And so my point is, I think these growth rates that Dell and HPE are promising, basically one to 4%, is really conservative. And I think yeah, they're going to probably there, beat a, these expectations. Because there's a massive demand for more hardware right now. And they now. have visibility so and, and big backlogs. The on-prem growth is happening. The AI bug is all about, if I'm going to have a neural network, I need different hardware. Okay, you're not going to get more out of an x86. You need the systems around it, Ethernet, and you heard liquid cooling is going to be in the, in the whole other system architecture. So, you know, I think the AI wave is interesting, <laughs> David. NVLink, CUDA, it's NIMS, yeah. Nemo. Well, well, well David, gonna... I want to ask you, because you got the, the new episode out, the AI Insights and Innovations. With Which David is Lizard killing Gunn. it, by the way. Congratulations. Good, good job on Thank your, you for your amazing. podcast on Silicon Angle. Of course, you got your own. You also wrote for InfoWorld with the, the Whiplash article was hot, just brought, posted. But as you look to chronicalize the AI innovations, uh, and insights. There is a new architecture model emerging. What's your strategy with the podcast, the show? Um, what are you going to be covering? I actually wrote the Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing, which is the nice backdrop, by the way, in your camera angle. Uh, it's in mine, my podcast too, by the way. So check that book out, Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. But as AI starts, we start documenting the progress. Where are we on the progress bar? I, we're not very far. Uh, we're, at the, we're at the caveman stage uh, in terms of uh, where this stuff is moving into. We're just figuring out, by the way, AI's been around since the 50s. We're still trying to figure out how to optimize it and make it work, and here we are in 2024. So in terms of generative AI, which is really kind of the restart of, of, of AI, we're at the stage where we're trying to figure out what platforms to run them on, the use cases we need to use, how much this is going to be, is going to cost us, this is going to burn up the planet, you know, all this stuff that really haven't thought of it, but it gets really excited about generative AI. AI, hasn't looked at the hard planning it needs to occur. So the use cases are the biggest thing right now. So in other words, businesses need to figure out how to use this stuff and for what purpose. And it's funny, like even, 
the vendor shows that we go to and things like that, they haven't understand the use cases that are there. They don't figure out how to sell this stuff. Yeah. They know it's hot, but that needs to be the hardest part. That's going to be the hardest part to solve. The other thing is understanding we're moving to a heterogeneous uh, platform. So we're moving to AI on our iPhones, yeah. you know, with, with Apple intelligence and all these other things that are coming forward. What does that mean for the enterprises out there? How are you going to leverage this effectively? And so it's looking at the innovations where things are coming to, but not just looking at them and reporting what the innovations are, but looking at the CIO and looking at the CTO and then these enterprises out there and telling them how it's going to affect them and how they have to change behaviors to make them make themselves a winner. You know, I'm glad you brought up use cases because I mean was, this is a strong show. The, the Sphere, the keynotes, the NVIDIA partnership, yeah. uh, the, the, the ops ramp stuff, the ecosystem growth, all that, very high marks. The one missing piece that I see is HPE's not talking, they're a $30 billion company, they're not talking about how they're dog fooding uh, AI inside the company and what use cases they have, how they're prioritizing, where they're potentially seeing ROI. Uh, they're not, they haven't talked about that the, at all, the dog fooding or drinking your own champagne. I think that's one area where they could really help customers. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think they could. I think ultimately I, I would have loved to see in the keynote I sat in today, I heard the guy from Mercedes who was ta talking about a storage solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get it, that's, that's cool. But I'm talking about like a killer AI application that runs on their stuff that they can point to that they're even doing internally. Yeah, yeah. In other words, we built an engineering system, we built a deployment system, we built a, a BCDR system using this AI platform. I don't see those use cases yeah. from them. You do see it from Amazon, you do see it from Google, and you do see it from Microsoft and the other AI AI players that are out there, but it would love them. I love the point, you eat their own dog foods is exactly right. So in other yeah. words, how are you using it, how are you successful with yeah. it, therefore how are you recommending that your customers be successful Yeah, we brought them. the AI to the data. Well, I, that think, would be a I think they're also, they're also um, I'm maybe a bad choice of words, but spoon feeding their customer base what AI is with NVIDIA, I think that's a big thing to grok. Um, one of the things that I think they're hiding the ball on is, you know, the hottest companies right now are Databricks, that came out of the failure of Hadoop, and Spark made that happen. They remember, they bought MapR. MapR was a, the Hadoop for the enterprise, which was different than, this, so they have a DNA in this data that became Esmeralda. They're not telling that story. Well, but they're I integrating mean, it. They're not really telling well, the story, I mean, you're right, but they are come, integrating well, it. Well, it comes down to use it's cases. It's their data so, fabric, and it does come down to use well, cases. If they're right. going to do a use case and show compute, you got to show some meat on the bone. That's where the data piece comes in. To me, they don't have that yet. And I think, I'm not sure if that's just, they didn't want to confuse the market, or they don't have it. They do. They did represent a data, uh, a data lake that's attached to their uh, uh, to their private cloud system. Esmeral. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's going to be fine. Some, sometimes that can be problematic because everybody doesn't want to use that. Bring your own data, data lake. Right. People want to yeah. bring their own data. They want to bring their own licenses. They want to run the core AI systems. And so, if you're going to show me a framework, show something that's going to be open and extensible and be able to plug this stuff in. And I think that's what's missing from a lot of the vendors. Even if you go to an AWS, I guarantee a reInvent's going to be like this. They're going to show you a stack that's only their stuff, nothing else, again, yeah. and don't show you how to make all your various systems work and play <laughs> well with the environment. Now they are open here and they're showing you how the integration occurs, but that's where the war is going to get fought. Uh, yeah. The complexity, the integration of it, the, the ability to have this information coexist. We're not going to start moving stuff to proprietary databases just because you tell us that's attached to your AI yeah. system. Remember back in the old days of proprietary NOS, I'll bring it again, the big buzzword was interoperability, heterogeneous was happening, those networks were happening. That's happening now, I totally agree with you on that. I think that's the key. What would you advise HPE if they asked you, we're the board, we're, the, we're Antonio's management team. David, advise me, what should we do? I would tell them to figure out the complexity angle and also figure out how to prepackage AI in such a way that it's going to be a bundle that people are going to consume. I saw a pretty good start today. They're going to have to build on that. Lots of missing pieces, lots of how you do with inference engines, all these sorts of things. What are the 10 based architectures that I would base your system around? And how do I build those architectures in your particular environment? And I would publish those and I would push those out and I would have next year at this show, have one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 10 where people can walk around and figure out these architectures are going to be right for their, for their tech. And the ability to bundle it and come with a prepackaged solution has a huge amount of value because people are moving to cloud because it's more convenient yeah. to build AI in cloud because they, they have pre-configured ecosystems in the cloud. Make that happen within 
and HPE equipment. Go after the architectures, go after the 10 base, best use cases. That's what I would be telling HPE right Final now. Final question, I know we got to wrap our next guests are here, but since you're here, you had the great talk, we were watching you at the Tech Talk. Um, what was the reaction after the event? Because this always happens after you're done talking, big crowd, I saw a big crowd there. So I'm assuming people came up after and said, you did a great job or you did a bad job. What did they say? I mean, what was the feedback? Not good job, bad, but, but what, like, would they say you're on point, you missed something? What was the tone? What was the I'm, sentiment? I'm so glad you said that because <laughs> no one has said that. And, and the ability to look at repatriation, the value of cloud, and the ability to normalize the value of cloud within the modern enterprises. And there were CIOs over there, CTOs over there, high, high level individuals uh, who make those core decisions, and quite frankly, they're confused. Yeah, and, you, and so you spoke reality to them. They were, to them was, thank you for giving a dose of reality. Right, I, I spoke truth to confusion. <laughs> <laughs> truth to power who was confused, so confused power. Truth to confused power. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Hey, that's what we do, we try to make people simple Simplify the message. Of course, we're bringing you the CUBE data here. CUBE research is on the ground in force. SiliconANGLE team is here as well. The CUBE and SiliconANGLE team coverage, again, getting the most of data in real time for you. We'll be back with more. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, and David Lithicaman, Rebecca Knight, Rob Streche, Bob Liberté, the whole team's here. Mark Albertson, Rob Hof. We'll be right back. <laughs>